Um, yes, yeah, so I, I appreciate uh, being here today at the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. I'm from Wilmington, so not too far from your neck of the woods. So we were all similarly disappointed at the Super Bowl last week. I told my wife I was going to be speaking to a skeptics group, and she said, or are you? Um, this is actually a talk that I've given to the National Capital Area Skeptics. I live down in D.C. Um, and uh, pleased to be able to uh, talk to you guys, too. So um, as Eric mentioned, um, I've, uh, I I'm a molecular biologist. I also host some uh, TV shows, Science Channel, things like that. And I write a kid's show that's on PBS Kids called Eleanor Wonders Why. Um, and so I've had a lot of time to think about how people view science, how people think about science. And, um, and this talk is basically the one hour version of a semester long class I used to teach at Johns Hopkins. Um, and uh, there's some examples in here that maybe, maybe work a little better on undergrads who are naive to things than they do on skeptics such as yourselves, but we'll, we'll get to those when we get to those. Um, so the idea for the class and for this subject in general for me to teach it came from um, experience that I had in 2000. I was in the lab, um, and you know this this is this is the way that scientists kind of naively view the public. We we have this misperception that a scientist announces a major discovery, and people say yay and thank us, and and everything is terrific. Um, and that's not, of course, how it always goes because not everybody has that view of science, and science is not exactly monolithic. And so the idea came when I was sitting in lab in 2000, I was listening to NPR, which is basically what everybody does in labs. And um, they just announced the completion of the human genome sequencing. And I went back and I was able to find transcripts of what I must have been listening to at the time. I was probably talk of the nation. And I, was, I, I thought people were going to call in and say, this is wonderful. They sequenced the human genome. What, what can we do with this information? Instead, a lot of people were calling in and saying, you shouldn't have done this. Um, scientists are going too far in sequencing the human genome. So this is one piece of what I found online that I must've been listening to. Pete in St. Louis found it disturbing that scientists had sequenced the human genome. Human beings are complex enough. Do you really want to be able to program them and control them and manipulate it for war purposes? And I'm sitting there thinking like, no, we, no one wants to manipulate and control human beings for war purposes, but that's not at all what happened when the human genome was sequenced. All we got was a whole string of A, C's, G's and T's there is no means of manipulating that for war purposes that I know of. Um, and yet people had this misperception about what happened and they were more than willing to form opinions based on their own idea of what the science actually was and not what the science actually was. Here is an example that being skeptics, you guys have probably all heard of, but um, I always present this to my undergrads and, and I, I tell them I'm about to show you um, basically a piece of propaganda, but it's all true. Everything in this is true. It's about a chemical called dihydrogen monoxide. Um, it is colorless, odorless, tasteless. It kills thousands of people a year, um, mostly due to accidental inhalation. And I, you know, I go through a number of the other properties of dihydrogen monoxide. And, um, and actually it's so prevalent that it's been found in almost every lake, stream and reservoir in the US today. And if we were doing this talk in person, I would sort of stop and get a sense of how many of you um, would, would feel certain ways about this chemical, although again, you guys probably have all heard of this. Um, and so what I ask my students then is knowing all of that, with all of that being true, do you think that this chemical, DHMO, dihydrogen monoxide, should be allowed for anyone to use freely, regulated in some way, or outright banned? And um, then I, I pause and see who votes for what. And usually, I, I don't think I've ever gotten a class of undergraduates that have all said it should be allowed across the board. Um, usually people don't go right to banning either, but I would say somewhere between a quarter and a half of the class often says that something like this ought to be regulated. We ask for their reasons and they say, look, it can be a danger in the wrong hands, et cetera, et cetera. And that is when I reveal, as some of you may already know, that dihydrogen monoxide um, is actually a chemical you may be familiar with. It has another name, dihydrogen, two hydrogens, monoxide, one oxygen, so H2O. Um, and so if you just agreed to ban dihydrogen monoxide, then you think we ought to ban water. And what exactly is this coalition to ban dihydrogen monoxide? It was basically an internet joke before the, there was an internet. Um, it started in 1983 with um, in, uh, the Durand Express in Michigan, just a, a joke newspaper warning about dihydrogen monoxide in the water pipes, because of course that's where it is, it's water. 
Um, and then as more people found this funny, they started adding more di dihydrogen monoxide facts. So things like um, you know, the, the, uh, the Navy is storing vast quantities of dihydrogen monoxide for use in warfare. And um, athletes become dependent on dihydrogen monoxide and withdrawal leads to certain death. And every athlete implicated in a do doping scandal has been also found to be addicted to dihydrogen monoxide, you know, things like that, all jokes. Um, but even the silliest joke like this creeps over into real life. Um, in 1990, this gained notoriety in the country again, when a couple of guys, a couple of students at UC Santa Cruz circulated a petition um, or a, a contamination warning to get people um, aware of dihydrogen monoxide, again, as a joke. And then it made the news again in 1997 when a, um, a student in Idaho won first prize <coughs> me, at a science fair for getting his uh, fellow classmates to sign a petition banning dihydrogen monoxide. The title of his project was How Gullible Are We? Um, but here's where dihydrogen monoxide, even this little silly example, creeps over into real life. In 2004, um, they, they announced that uh, dihydrogen monoxide was used in the production of styrofoam cups. And this actually made it into a local report where they were trying to, um, trying to protest the use of styrofoam cups at the stadium. And one of the reasons was that dihydrogen monoxide was made, uh, was used in their creation. Two weeks later, a couple of DJs in Bremerton, Washington picked this up and made a joke about there being dihydrogen monoxide in the water pipes. And apparently people were calling city offices all morning and, um, and people were upset that they, they had heard this on the radio. Um, other DJs nine years later on April Fool's Day did not learn the lesson in Florida. They again warned listeners, it was DHMO in the water pipes. Um, and I think they were actually fired from their jobs because of this joke, because it, it actually did once again, cost county officials time trying to respond to people. So people don't understand science and that's often a problem. Um, but what, what is it that scientists can do about it? So um, I want to switch over from talking to uh, talking about dihydrogen monoxide to uh, giving you guys a, and again, I guess we can't really do this well on Zoom. I'm, the, the last thing I want to do right now is just give everybody free reign to go nuts on Zoom because we saw what happened at the beginning of the talk. Um, but I'll, I'll just tell you the way this survey often goes. So this is a professor of mine from college, Lee Silver, had this great survey where he asked everybody, what they feel about different types of human reproductive biotechnology, different technologies used to help human beings, uh, human beings reproduce. And so he asked, you know, you know, three categories that this is a technology I'm going to name and should everybody be allowed to use it? Should it be allowed only for infertile couples to reproduce who have no other means of reproduction or should it be banned for everybody? And first he asks about IVF, in vitro fertilization. And most people think that IVF should be open and available to anyone who wants to use it, regardless of whether they can create a baby by some other means. Um, and and he, as he told us, he said, that's, that's normal now. That was not the reaction when IVF was first announced. Um, the first IVF baby was born in 1978, Louise Joy Brown. And um, in the time in 1978, the idea that a human being could be fertilized in a Petri dish outside the womb instead of within a person that created a lot of uh, a lot of scare, and most people did not favor IVF. It seemed like something unnatural was going to happen. But nowadays, you know, there are forty-year-olds walking around who were created, you know, inseminated via IVF, and um, and they're just like everybody else. So then he asks, "What about the use of cloning to produce human children?" And that's where a lot of this talk is going to go to. And he would say, "How many people think that cloning should be allowed?" used only in the case of infertile couples or banned. Most people would put up their hands under banned. We don't want to be cloning human beings. It doesn't sound safe. It doesn't sound like an area we want to go to. Um, and that's, that's a pretty standard reaction too. The third one he asks about is a bit of a longer definition. So you have to take a, a minute to sort of read and absorb it. A woman producing and carrying to term an embryo that contains genetic material obtained entirely from one of her own cells. So if you think about that definition, um, and then if we had a vote, um, think of which way you would vote, whether that should be allowed for everybody, banned across the board, or in the, the middle option is you know, only allowed for couples who cannot reproduce another way. What often happens is that a lot of people change their minds between uh, option two and option three. They have a different reaction to number two, cloning, and number three, this definition. 
And what Professor Silver would reveal to our class, which I would then reveal if we were in person and actually doing the survey thing, is um, that if you change your mind between number two and number three, you change your mind about nothing. Because number three has a term for it, and that term is cloning. And that's what we're talking about with scientific, uh, with perception of science. Understanding what science means, understanding what different forms of technology actually are, and not what science fiction has kind of, you know, uh, conditioned us to think they are. So this, this is normal human reproduction. Um, in a very, very simplified scale. And it's not the picture that the guy Zoom bombed us with at the beginning. That is a very different form of reproduction. So this is a, um, this is a single cell embryo. This is back when you were just one cell. In the center there is a coil of DNA. Not, none of it looks anything like this, but it's a cartoon. Um, after that cell is fertilized, the uh, cell then divides into two. Now, if these two cells split apart, each one has the exact same DNA, the exact same recipe book for how to make a human being. And so if these two cells split, instead of staying stuck together, they become identical twins. Two then becomes four. If these four happen to all split apart and develop into, uh, into embryos, those would be identical quadruplets. Now it doesn't keep working like that ad infinitum, um, but that's, that's, the, uh, that's how this works, that each cell in our bodies has the same recipe book and, and that's even true now. The trillion cells in your body each have the same recipe book. It's just that some of them make more or less of one or another recipe so that they can become a blood cell, a tooth cell, a hair cell, whatever, um, and eventually becoming the one trillion cells or so in a human being. This is what cloning is. Cloning is taking a developed cell, a cell that's already decided what its fate is going to be. So let's just say a skin cell, a square skin cell, taking a different fertilized egg, removing the DNA from that egg and moving the DNA from that adult person's square skin cell into the circular egg and starting it dividing to two to four and so on to a human being. So basically, a clone is an identical twin born a generation later. That is what a clone is. Um, knowing this, there are a lot of myths about cloning that we know cannot be true. Um, and then I give my students a pop quiz at this point, which again, is gonna be hard to do on Zoom. What I ask them is if I clone you right now and you're exactly 18 years old, how old will your clone be a year from today? So take a moment to think about it. So the wrong guest answer is 19, because if I clone you right now, that clone is not gonna be 18 years old instantly. One year old is also a wrong answer. The correct answer is three months old. Because if I clone you now, that clone still has to gestate inside a woman for nine months. You can't do this process without gestation inside a woman. Um, so here are some cloning myths that you know cannot be true anymore. Um, for example, the clone being an exact copy of the original. Well, the clone is a genetic copy of the original, but they're no more the same person or the same cloned creature any more than identical twins are the same person. If anyone knows identical twins, you know that they probably look the same, um, but they're not the same person. And you can see a great visible representation of this with Cece. This is Cece, uh, which is short for copycat or carbon copy. She was the world's first cloned cat, um, I think in 2002. Here's a picture of Cece with her surrogate mother, Allie. This, this is the cat in whose womb Cece gestated. Um, and here's the cat that Cece was cloned from, Rainbow. Um, excuse me, what, one of the first things you notice when you look at both Cece and Rainbow is that they don't even look the same, right? Rainbow is kind of a calico cat and Cece is like white and tortoiseshell. Well, how could that be true? If they're exact clones, shouldn't they at least look the same? The answer is, Cat fur color is partially determined by conditions inside the womb, not just genetics. And so the point here is that as early as pre-birth, clones show ways in which they're different from each other. And when you know this about cloning, suddenly the things that make cloning sound fearful, um, or not fearful, but fear-mongering, fear, fear to fear, um, suddenly become not quite so scary. 
there's a myth about cloning involving the manipulation of genetic traits, um, that if you clone a rooster, you can make a giant rooster. And that's not cloning, that's genetic engineering, that's changing things. Cloning is deliberately keeping things the same. And of course, an army of clones. Well, let's say I wanted to create a clone army, which is what Pete in St. Louis was afraid of back in that first slide. If I wanted to create an army of 100,000 clones, what's the first ingredient I would need? 100,000 women, right? I need 100,000 women all willing to bring to term all of these clones inside their wombs. And then if everything went well, nine months later, I'd have 100,000 babies who I would have to raise over the next 18 years and then convince them to join my army. It's a lot of work to make a clone army. And there's no sign that it would be any better than a real army where there are actual 18 year olds walking around sometimes now who wanna join the army and you just convince them to join it. So an army of clones is interesting in a Star Wars sense, but it's not a real thing. And it's not, uh, it's not something that even could be a real thing. So if you notice the background of my slides, you know where a lot of this is going. And some of you may remember this event as well. And um, we're now celebrating the, is this, oh my goodness, we're almost at the 26th anniversary of, um, of the announcement of the cloning of Dolly the sheep. Do you remember where you were when this happened? So it was a big deal, right? Scientists in Scotland had cloned a sheep. Before this, no one had ever cloned a mammal. Well, that's not entirely true. Actually, other scientists in Scotland had cloned uh, two sheep named Megan and Morag about a year earlier, but they were cloned from, um, from an undeveloped cell. Dolly was cloned from a developed adult cell. It's a big difference, but um, it's something that people often forget. So this is the original article in Nature, the scientific journal, that announced the cloning of Dolly the sheep. That's Dolly, it's her picture there. Um, she's the sheep with the white face. The one with the black face is the sheep in whose womb she gestated. And I think that was partially done for just the visual striking effect of, look, this is not the actual genetic daughter of the black faced sheep. This is a clone of a completely different sheep. Um, and when Dolly was born, it was a big deal. The world started talking about cloning. We're gonna look at the reaction to Dolly in a minute. Um, but before we do that, just take a quick look at this article, um, viable offspring derived from fetal and adult mammalian cells. Scientists really know how to write the attention grabbing headlines. And if you read the entire article, which I don't recommend because it's a scientific paper and they're, they're going to be really boring, you will see that they use the word cloning or versions of the word cloning, cloned, clones, cloners, a grand total of zero times. They never even say cloning in this article. They say somatic cell nuclear transfer, the, se the transfer of a nucleus from a somatic cell. Um, however, when the public got a hold of Dolly, it became a giant deal. It was huge. Everyone was talking about clones and what is this going to mean for us? I love this cover from Time Magazine in uh, February of 97. So again, Dolly was born in 96 and announced in 97. Um, and this cover, I think, shows graphically several of the things that the media got wrong about Dolly. First of all, first thing you notice, two sheep right next to each other. There's a sheep and a photo of the exact same sheep. The implication, even though they're not saying it, is that if scientists cloned a sheep, that could mean they created another sheep that was exactly the same as the first sheep instantly. Like imagine a photocopier. The second thing you look at is in the background of the picture, lots of tiny little sheep faces. So the implication here is if you can create one, you can create an army of sheep. Um, I don't think it helped things for Dolly's case that she happened to be a sheep as opposed to some other animal because sheep kind of, you know, have a reputation for being followers. Um, <clears throat> next thing they did was the headline, will there ever be another you? Besides the Y-O-U, E-W-E puns, which were everywhere, um, a lot of what happened in the media was not just scientists cloned a sheep, it was Scientists cloned a sheep are people next. We'll see some more of that in a minute too. Um, and then finally, the last thing you see in the upper right is a, there's a fiction bonus, Clone on the Range by Douglas Copeland. I read it, it's not that great. And there's nothing wrong with, with Time Magazine publishing fiction, but it did sort of underscore the fact that it, we now seem to be living in fictional times. It was very sudden that you can't just create life like Dr. Frankenstein did. Oh wait, in Scotland they did and here's a sheep. And so that was, that was scary to people who didn't understand what exactly those Scottish scientists did and what they didn't do. Um, the magazine Der Spiegel was a little less subtle. 
So uh, you can see the implication here is if you can clone a sheep, you could also clone Hitler or Einstein, or um, I'm told that's Claudia Schiffer. Those are the big three, really. I don't know how they picked her. If you translate the German, science on the way to clone people, der Sundenfall, the fall of man. Here are some of the images the media used for CC. Now, um, CC was cloned again in 2002, so that you can just get internet articles from that era. And they took pictures for, for the media. Here's a picture of CC inside a beaker, um, implying that she is a product of science and not of nature. It's actually very similar to beaker to what I happen to be drinking my tea out of right now. Scientists don't always drink tea from beakers. I just happen to have this one. I like it. Um, here's an image they used of CC staring into a mirror. So you've got the you know two cats image, but also she's kind of contemplative, like she's asking, should I be? And this is this is my favorite. This one's from the BBC. Um, it's not even the same cat. It's just random cat and badly photoshopped half of same cat. Here's some of the headlines about Dolly from February 1997 when she was announced. Uh, Scottish scientists clone adult sheep techniques use with humans is feared. Toronto Star said this is Dolly the clone, the daughter of none. Genetic marvel spawns potential ethical nightmare. So this was a this is a bomb about um, the cloning of Dolly. This wasn't a small deal. Um, Hello, Dolly. Bye bye, daddy. His first cloned animal set to meet the world. Bye bye, daddy. In other words, you don't need a father to reproduce anymore because now we can simply clone. Um, first cloned lamb paves way for life by production line. Again, we're getting into science fiction really fast. And uh, cloners, you turn, excuse me, stuns, again, the pun with EWE. Uh, Scottish scientists clone sheep and create exact copy. And again, as we talked about, Dolly is not an exact copy. She's just a genetically identical twin born a generation later. This was, if you want to go find something ridiculous, you read the entirety of this thing. This is an editorial from USA Today by someone named Craig Wilson um, called To Be or Not To Be, One of Each of Us is Enough. And he goes into um, how his uncle seemed to be a fine person, but no one ever want two of his uncle around. And so this cloning is a scary thing. He, and he said, clone murders could become commonplace, but what happens then? Are you charged with murder or suicide? And <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I'd like to think that most of us would watch this and uh, or would read this this uh, article this editorial and say oh ha ha that's kind of funny but you know that there are people reading this saying yes craig wilson you ask the tough questions you ask the questions those scientists don't want to ask but it's ridiculous if you were murder if you murder a clone you are charged with murder because it's a person you murder a twin you're charged with murder this is my favorite. I just had to throw this up there. Uh, if anyone remembers the Weekly World News from the supermarket checkout line of your, uh, this is the headline about Dolly from the Weekly World News. Dolly the cloned sheep kills a lamb and eats it. And uh, it's it's just a ridiculous article about when she looks at you with those burning red eyes, those intense red eyes full of hate, um, and she's just filled with evil. Um, so yeah, and you look at the capture of the photo, a little lamb was placed in Dolly's pen overnight, all appeared normal until the next day. For those of you who are young enough not to know what the weekly world news is, uh, it was weird that this thing existed for so long. It was basically a, a tabloid newspaper at the supermarket checkout. It was just full of not satire because you got the sense that it thought it was true. This is Dolly today. Um, this is a jumper, as they call it in England, or a, a sweater uh, made from Dolly's wool. Dolly was euthanized in 2003. She was six years old. Um, she had respiratory illnesses, and that's led to a lot of questions. People asking, was she sick at an early age because she was a clone? Um, there's a book called After Dolly by uh, Ian Wilmot and Roger Campbell, who were you know among the original team who cloned Dolly. They talked about how respiratory diseases in adult sheep are not at all rare. Could be that something was going around. No one really knows. Um, but regardless, even in death, Dolly is still enshrined in this two sheep, two identical adult sheep motif. You can see at the bottom of the sweater, it says one plus one equals two. And you can see the sheep on the collar and split across the sleeves and everything. Um, and so that was a long time ago. You know, that was a quarter century ago. But this keeps coming back. Some of you may remember in 2013, headlines um, were big about the cloning of the gastric brooding frog. Gastric meaning stomach, 
brood is their young. I believe they they rate they uh, gestate not they they gestate their young in their stomach or they just travel with their young in their stomach. But that's why that frog's got a little frog creepily inside its mouth. Um, and the gastric brooding frog went extinct, and uh, scientists had some cryopreserved samples and were able to reproduce a gastric brooding frog embryo. And it was the first example of successful, I don't want to say successful de-extinction because the gastric brooding frog is not back in the wild, but the creation of an embryo of a, uh, an extinct animal. So what do you think people thought of that when it was announced? Well, here's some headlines about the gastric brooding frog. In the, in the UK, the Guardian said, cl scientists clone extinct frog, Jurassic Park, here we come. There were so many articles that mentioned Jurassic Park because you know that's the top of your mind. If you're gonna start cloning extinct animals, you have to be careful because otherwise they will get out of their pens and kill all of you. The New York Times, so you're extinct? Scientists have gleam in eye. It's a little ominous, isn't it? Who trusts a scientist with a gleam in their eye? Um, and my, uh, the French Tribune, from dead to alive, science magic. That's what science is, it is magic. And the way that people think about science, um, I, I don't wanna say, you know, I don't wanna have a, a unilateral message of people are dumb, people don't know science, because that's not really true either. And I wanna show you this example too. Some of you might've seen this circulating on Facebook in 2015. Um, it was an article in the Washington Post that said that over 80% of Americans answered a survey saying that they support mandatory labels on foods containing DNA. And if you're like me, you got this in your Facebook feed and all of your friends started piling on saying people are idiots. You know, of course food contains DNA. How can people want that to be labeled? I, I told someone this once and they said, actually they ought to label foods that don't contain DNA. That's a, that's a, it's a little scarier. Although I guess not necessarily like you wouldn't want your salt to say it doesn't contain DNA because of course it doesn't have salt. Um, but what was this original thing where they decided that 80% of Americans favor this? So if you dig deeper, um, this is a, a study from the Department of Agricultural Economics at Oklahoma State University, where they asked people if they would support this. In what context did they ask people? Well, they asked them 10 questions. Which do you support? Which do you suppose? Everything from a tax on sugared sodas to mandatory calorie labels on restaurant menus. And you can see number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the list there out of these 10 questions is mandatory labels on foods containing DNA. 80.44% support. Um, these questions were randomized when they were presented to people, but you can absolutely see how in this context, someone being asked this question might think it meant something else, right? They might think that it meant mandatory labels on genetically modified foods, which a lot of Americans do support. And in fact, has so much support that I think they have laws about that in, in Europe. Um, or maybe it meant something deeper. And, you know, What's strange is that uh, other studies have shown that DNA is one of the things in science that most people really do understand. Uh, the study from the University of Michigan 2011 found that 85% of American adult, adults know that all plants and animals have DNA. So if that many people know that all plants and animals have it, could they really want us to label all the foods that have it? Or is there something a little deeper going on here? You have to take these kind of headlines with a grain of salt and look into how these things are are being asked, and you know uh, whether you're react whether you yourself as a scientist and a scientifically literate person may be reacting too far in the opposite direction. What people think about science also goes a lot to uh, to tell you about what people think about scientists, and in many ways, the product of what people think about scientists. If you want to know what people think a scientist is, just Google, do a Google image search for science, uh, for scientist. I did, and here it is. Um, take a look. This is what comes up at the very beginning of my Google search. It's, you're going to get something different if you try it, because it's kind of, you know, location and person dependent. But here you go. People think that scientists are all insane, elderly, white, male chemists. That's the stereotype of what scientists are. And look at the different options at the top. Clip art, in lab, famous, in lab coat, mad. We are one of only two professions that takes the adjective mad. The other one is hatters. Um, I didn't have a lot of friends in college who were pre-hat. Like, I'm going to become a hatter someday. So um, we, we live in a bubble in some ways. I know that I certainly do. I grew up in Delaware where half of my classmates' parents worked for DuPont. Uh, my mother worked for DuPont. She's a, an anatomist. She's a PhD. 
I grew up knowing what a scientist is and that a scientist was a real person. We have to remember that people can, you know, kids can get to 12th grade having met a lot of science teachers, but having never ever met a scientist. And so to them, to a lot of people, scientist is like wizard. This caricature, this cartoon of what a scientist looks like, that's what a scientist is in their mind. And when that's what a scientist is, a scientist is an ominous figure. Um, you can also just, uh, instead of the images, you can do Google autocomplete and type in, you know, beginnings of questions about scientists and see what people search for. Why are scientists concerned about invasive species, atheists, liberals? We're all atheist liberals. So <laughs> that's good to know. Scientists are so uh, stupid, important, arrogant, interested in solar neutrinos. I couldn't figure out why that made the top four, but then I saw that the, the, the SO in solar is not bolded. So I think um, it just caught the SO in the question. Do scientists, do scientists believe in God, ghosts, evolution, and Bigfoot, which are the four main areas of scientific research? If you really want to know what people think scientists are, you can also just go to children and tell them to draw a scientist. And this is a great, um, this great idea uh, had by a scientist named D.W. Chambers in Australia in 1983, where he asked students to, I guess, third through fifth grade, somewhere around that range, to draw a scientist. These are some of the pictures from his original paper. So on the left, you can see um, the guy with the, the mustache, the beard, the triangular legs, um, same sort of thing, the, the chemistry beakers, the lab coat. In the middle, again with the mustache, maybe this is just the 1983 thing, everybody had creepy mustaches in those days. Um, and I think that thing next to him is either a modern 1983 computer or else a washing machine. But either way, you've got, um, <clears throat> you've got the, the lab coat and the beaker, and I'm the guy on the right holding up a beaker with a door that says, keep out monster inside, or actually it says monster. So it was just his fridge where he keeps his cheese. The last line of Chambers' paper is actually the most interesting part of the paper, where he says, in almost every third to fifth grade class tested, at least one child, and occasionally more, drew signs on the doors and walls of the lab that said, keep out, private, do not enter, go away, top secret. So what this told Chambers is that there is this perception, at least among children, that science is not for you. Science is for those who have it in the inner circle, those kind of crazy uh, people doing things that they don't want you to see. And that's exactly the kind of reputation that is harmful to science. This test has been done and redone over the years um, in an interesting new way. So now they'll do this, but add two steps. They'll draw, have kids draw a scientist, then they'll have them meet some scientists, and then they'll have them draw a scientist again. Um, I found a great example of this online. This is from some students who um, visited Fermilab. This is what the students drew before and after. The before and after are each drawn by the same student. So you can see I mean, the same, you know, the same three students, one, then two, then three. So you can see that um, before all of them drew someone with a lab coat, beaker, glasses. After they drew human beings. Two of them even drew women. Uh, the guy on the right just drew the rock. I, maybe maybe he didn't understand the assignment. Um, <clears throat> but the point is he didn't just draw a stereotypical scientist with a lab coat and a beaker. Um, and they asked the kids afterwards, just from one day of meeting scientists, what did you learn? And the kid who drew the rock on the right, he said, uh, beforehand they asked him, and he said, a scientist looks like a person who is in their 30s to 50s, has glasses, and is somewhat balding. Love that description. What, how do you? You get fired after your 50s. Um, and then after, he said, the scientists were like me when I was little. The scientists played sports, hung out with their friends, and also did not get straight A's in every subject. That little bit of information, scientists are human beings, is what, is, is what science often has trouble communicating and what there's a widespread misperception about. And it's very important, not just for getting the next generation interested in studying science, but also for getting the public to trust scientists. So what I like to tell people is the next time a scientist announces um, a, a major breakthrough, rather than reacting by immediately condemning it or even immediately celebrating it, you should want to immediately go and learn more about what actually happened. This is usually the last slide, and um, but I had to add a slide in the past couple of years because we've now seen in the past three years things. We live in a world where public perception of science is more vital than ever. When scientists are issuing warnings to people to the best of our ability, 
and people don't trust those warnings because they come from scientists or because the scientists have communicated them in a, an untrustworthy way, we suddenly have to think about perception every single day. And I'm not going to have a, a long diversion in, into COVID, but basically, whether people trust COVID vaccines, whether people trust COVID tests, um, whether people believe that in uh, scientifically debunked cures for COVID, whether people believe that certain preventative measures for COVID are valid or not, it's all a matter of public perception of science, and we all make those calculations every single day. Tonight, I'm performing in a theater in Baltimore. There are going to be 200 people in the audience. I'm going to wear a mask, but not when I'm on stage, but that's a scientific perception calculation. I have to think about knowing what I know, what level of risk am I comfortable with? What level of risk am I not comfortable with? And these never used to be daily questions for most of us that now are. Um, so I wanna thank everybody for, um, for listening. I'll gladly take questions people have. I can see there's some things popping up in the chat. Thank goodness they're not about Hitler this time. Um, and yeah, um, take any questions. Okay, and, and I should be here. Can, can everybody hear me? Adam, can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. Okay, yes. good. Okay, I, I'm Becky Strickland. I'm the Secretary of FACT, and I generally do the Q&A. So um, we have a couple questions already. Excellent. And please be sure you put a Q in front of it, because that's how I'll know their questions. And I'm having a little trouble with the scroll, but that's me, not <laughs> anything else. Okay, since many humans are conditioned to be good economic slaves, hmm, um, will there ever be a curriculum instituted to teach us to think logically? I think there are. Wow, some. That, you take that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a. Um, I mean, that's a that's a big overarching question. Um, teaching us to think logically. I mean. Think about who's who's doing the teaching. It's usually teachers. And teachers, like scientists, teachers are human beings. And so that means they're not monolithic either. You've got the whole gamut of teachers who have some kind of, you know, think think back to your teachers, think back to the whole range of teachers, those who have a, a sincere, a constant interest in making sure that you learn to think for yourselves, and those who hand out worksheets, and those who have some other agenda and those who get to a school and fall asleep at the table. Again, I'm just thinking of my high school, um, but it's, it's a whole range. I do think we will always have teachers and, um, and professors who want their students to think for themselves, um, but because it's, because it's as much of a range as it is with anything else, because everybody's human, um, it's not going to be everybody. And I'm sorry if it was a general answer to a general question. Well, yeah, that's that's. Um, I I know that there are some. I, when I taught, I tried to teach critical thinking and logic, and uh, I was occasionally successful with it. Um, what if we could hold on? <clears throat> what if we could understand genes well enough to modify future people to be less likely to be addicted <laughs> and more likely to be aesthetic and wanting to learn rather than just seeking a simple limbic reaction in life. This is from our esteemed leader, Eric. <laughs> so what if what if we could genetically engineer people to be skeptics? Yes. Um, the, the thing is, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to be a, you know, never say never, but that's exactly the sort of thing that's so far beyond what gene editing can do. Um, right now, we're at the level of can we use gene editing? in a baby so they don't grow up with cystic fibrosis, mm -hmm. which is a not just a single gene, but a single letter of a single gene. You talk about something like people's tendencies to be skeptical or something like that. That is such a complicated mixture of lots of genes and lots of things that aren't genes, right? Nature and nurture, um, that it, it may not even be worth asking the question because it may not be something that's at all realistic. It's like if I said, well, what if we could teleport? Okay, what if we could, but that's not something that's likely to occur. Right. Um, anyway, it, it would be great if if more people were were skeptical, and and I think that's one of the things that you know, going back to the first question, that's one of the things that um, that ought to be taught more to to read and learn and think 
and criticize and question and think about where you're getting your data from and be willing to say that you're wrong. As you all know, human beings have no compunction about forming an opinion about something regardless of whether they understand it. Right. And we do that too. I'm, I'm guilty yes. of that too. Just ask my wife. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a human tendency to, to want yes. to dig in your yes. heels. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, I don't want to take time away from the other questions, but I feel like I have to give this example because this is um, something I learned once that was it was so interesting. Um, I gave a talk a few years ago at Rocky Mountain uh, National Lab in Hamilton, Montana. So it's basically this biosafety level four NIH lab where they study things like Ebola, um, you know, the, the most dangerous organisms. And it's in this rural community in Montana. And when the lab moved there, um, it, it was it, this little town of Hamilton basically became a mixture of, you know, um, rural Montanans living two hours outside of Helena and PhDs. And it was a big conflict. And I talked to the guy whose job it basically was to, um, to make sure that the people in the town accepted this influx of scientists and this new facility. And I asked him how he did it. And he said, just slowly over time being as open as possible. He said the first thing he did was tell everybody in town, if they want to know what's going on in the science labs, if they want to know what the scientists are doing, here's my phone number, here's my email address, contact me, I'll give you a tour, I'll walk around with you. And when I was there, he'd been there for at least 10 years, I think, you know, he did as many things as possible to get the scientists out in public. He had them give public talks at the high school. Um, he said, he, I think he put out a booth at the farmer's market where scientists can answer questions. Wow. And he, and he said that eventually they had to stop doing the booth because people stopped asking questions because they'd already come and asked their questions. And the groups that sued to shut them down, some of them became their biggest supporters because he didn't tell them, you guys don't understand, go away, we're the scientists, we're behind the fence here. He told them, we want to hear all of your criticisms. And if there's some of them that we should address, we're going to address them and we'll talk to you openly. And so that was his secret to getting people to understand and accept science and scientists, just complete openness. And also the scientists living there and their kids all going to school together mm -hmm. and people realizing the scientists were not some you know, mythical shadowy government figures, mm -hmm. they were human. That's a fabulous example. What a smart man, people smart. Yep. As if scientists can't be people smart. As soon as yeah. those words came out of my mouth. See, see. Let's take that back. Okay, um, that was excellent. What are your thoughts about the impact on beliefs about cloning? I'm going to read this, and then if I need to read it again, what are, sure. what are your thoughts about the impact on beliefs about cloning of the Schwarzenegger movie, The Sixth Day, where fully grown clones, try okay. to say that three times real fast, of the elite were made, including saved minds uploads uploads to cheat death? I'm sorry I could not read that better. Nope, that, that's okay. Um, I mean, I've so I haven't seen The Sixth Day. I've heard it talked about, but I've seen lots of similar movies that do similar things. Um, the Island is another one. I think it's like 2006 where they, um, where they're the very wealthy can have clones made and stored in an underground facility until they need a new liver or something. And then the clone is euthanized and their liver is given to the wealthy person. Um, Godsend is a terrible movie from 2004 uh, with Robert De Niro who looks embarrassed to be in the movie the whole time he's in it. Um, and, and Greg Kinnear and Rebecca Romain Stamos. It's basically a couple's son is killed in a car accident when he's eight. So they use cloning to rehab him. And um, everything goes well until the clone turns evil. Um, a lot of you may have seen the movie Multiplicity, 1997. Actually, I, I took the slide out about that. I don't know why I took that out. Um, if you had gone to the to Blockbuster the week that Dolly was announced, you would have seen on the new releases shelf the movie Multiplicity, which is with Michael Keaton and uh, Andy McDowell. And basically, Michael Keaton is a stressed, overworked contractor um, or a construction worker who, um, who needs more time for himself and more time for his family. And so a scientist offers to clone him. The clone is the same age as him, has the same memories. The cloning process takes about two hours. There's a little toaster ding when the clone is ready. Um, but then it's silly because he has to hide the clone in the garage. So uh, a lot of movies have been done like that, um, where the clone enters the world at the same point that, where they were cloned, at the same age, with the same memories, and only then do they diverge. Interesting. And it's exactly that sort of thing that gave people the wrong impression about Dolly. Yeah. And, and, you know, I have to say it didn't help just the coincidence that um, 
you know, Dolly was born in 96, as I said, and, and announced in 97. By that time, she was nearly an adult. And so, you know, anyone who wanted to come get a picture of Dolly would have gotten a picture of an adult sheep. And so that, you know, that probably contributed to, um, you know, to, to what happened. Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm reading over a couple of these questions. And, sure. and to everybody, I appreciate all your questions because I have to read them and um, Adam can't see them. It would be helpful if you make them very, very concise. <laughs> um, okay, what is your point of vision on YouTube podcast, social media scientists? I, Lex, Lex Friedman, don't know that name, Neil deGrasse Tyson, everybody knows him, as a way to break down complex, wicked problems that they know and don't. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure exactly what he was asking there. No problem. So just, just, you know, what do we think of, of scientists getting on YouTube and explaining science in accessible ways? I think it's something that a lot more scientists should do. Um, I can see the questions, Ed Gracely. I can see them. I just don't know which one Becky's going to ask next. I think that's, that's the issue. Um, yeah. So this is exactly what scientists ought to be doing. And that's what a lot of scientists don't do. I mean, a lot of scientists, um, I know people who would rather be in the lab for 40 years, then get up in front of an audience for 10 minutes. You know, sure. that's, and that's not just scientists. A lot of people are like that too. But I also have scientists who are far more interested in doing research than in ever communicating. And so I try to remind them as much as possible, um, talk to people. I feel like that's part of your job as a scientist <laughs> is to interact with the public and, you know, have some sort of, even if it's just giving a presentation to your child's kindergarten class, something that gets you out of the lab and has people meet a scientist and have you an answer questions. I, um, I was asked to give a talk once at this symposium that was run by a high school student. It was kind of weird. A high school student um, founded some sort of charity. Uh, I don't really know what it was, but she, she asked me to speak at her um, the symposium on a Saturday. And I found a couple other scientists to give talks about the research we were doing. And we didn't realize before we got there that for whatever reason, most of the audience were middle schoolers. And so all of a sudden we're looking at all of our slides that are not directed at middle schoolers and everyone had to on the fly adjust. And it was probably the most understandable, entertaining, interesting set of scientific talks I've ever attended. All the other people all of a sudden had to be thinking every time, how do I make sure my audience of sixth graders is following this? And the result was they went from giving the kind of talks that I usually fall asleep during to giving the kind of talks where I understand what they're saying all the time because they were making that effort. So mm -hmm. I, I often give that example to scientists too, that um, a lot of scientists don't have practice public speaking or at least think of it more of an, as an obligation than as an opportunity. And so I think a, a, lot of more, a lot more scientists ought to do things like that. And yes, in this age when anyone can create a YouTube channel, um, Right now, I'm, I'm helping to judge something called Dance Your PhD, which is run by AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science. They have graduate students um, making a video in which they perform an interpretive dance, an original interpretive dance of their PhD research that communicates the research and incorporates the dance. And, and these are amazing. Some of them are you know, huge production values. Some of them are, are funny. They're, they're informative. Um, and it's exactly the sort of thing that, once again, humanizes scientists. Interesting. Um, and Ed, to, to your question, because I know Ed. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the past, most of our speakers have preferred that I scroll through the questions and read them so they can just think of answers and not try to read while they're thinking. So sometimes it works well and sometimes it doesn't. And Adam, I didn't even ask you what you would prefer. I just... Oh, it really doesn't matter. Either way is fine. You can keep going. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> Um, do you think scientists would eventually be in favor of resurrecting a s extinct species? I, I think scientists are working on it now. I feel like I, and I wish I knew more about this to give you a definitive answer, but I feel like I just heard something in the past couple weeks about a serious project to clone the mammoth. Uh, was it the mammoth or the dodo? That's a big difference too. <laughs> um, one of them, one of them has been extinct a lot longer than the other. But I, I feel like there's just something really recently where a lot of money has just been earmarked for trying to de-extinct a species. Maybe it's mammoth, maybe it's dodo. I mean, with Jurassic Park, 
you have to rely on dinosaur DNA being intact for millions. It was a mammoth. Oh, thank you, Eleanor. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is something that scientists are interested in. Not most scientists. Most scientists aren't working on de-extinction. Most scientists are working on cancer, HIV, um, astronomy, you know, the law, every whole range of things, geology, weather, um, whatever. My, my friend does a lab where he researches the compounds made by fungi. Uh, everyone's doing something different, but there are some scientists that are interested in, in de-extinction. And um, my feeling is if, if it works, um, I don't see a tremendous danger to reintroducing a couple of frogs unless it's some invasive species that the world has already evolved to be without. Mm. That Good makes point. sense. Yeah. Um, but we can do more dangerous things than that now. Uh, there are starlings in the United States that are out competing native birds simply because someone in the 1800s thought it would be terrific to introduce every bird mentioned in Shakespeare into Central Park. Into Central Park. And so European starlings, here you go. And then all of a sudden, um, bye bye bluebirds. Yes. So there are far more dangerous things probably than um, tossing a gastric brooding frog into a swamp in Australia. Yeah. There's a lot to think about. A lot to think about with that. Um, this is from Eric. Again, what would you see as a path maybe in a few decades to do genetic modification on human gamete cells? I think you addressed this. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. DNA, but... yeah, I mean, the thing about cloning or cloning slash genetically engineering humans is that um, anything used on humans has to be entirely, I don't want to say entirely safe, but has to be really, really, really safe, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to mess around with a human embryo until you're certain that what you're doing to it um, is not going to cause problems. I mean, <clears throat> you, we can't even, uh, you know, there, there are chemicals that have to be taken out of products that are available now because they can harm people. Um, excuse me. So the idea of doing something genetically to harm people, uh, that, that may harm people, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to be uh, ever allowed until it can be demonstrated to be super, super safe. That's why there have been all these clones of animals, because there's a lot more leeway mm -hmm. with um, with research on animals than there is on humans. Well, and there was a, a serious accident at the University of Penn some years ago, wasn't there, with a, a gene editing? Um, I, I, a kid of, around age 20 died. Oh, that's, that's quite possible. I don't know about that. Okay. I mean, I know that... Um, Back when cloning was all the, the rage in the late 90s, there was, um, and, and there is gene therapy now. Um, David Langdon, kind of a Jesse Gelsinger. Uh, hold, hold that thought. Um, in, in the late 90s, I know that um, there are people who announced that they had cloned humans. Um, I just forgot the name. It starts with a Z. If someone knows it, maybe put it in the chat. Uh, it was uh, like this weirdo cult made of Israeli scientists who said that they had cloned three babies in Italy. Oh no, uh, it starts with an R. Real, real, Raelians, that's it, the Raelians. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they basically said, we've, we've already done human cloning and I think we, we got three Israeli women to give birth to the clones in, um, in Italy. And then basically the world media said, okay, great, show us any kind of proof. Like who are the women? And the Raelian said, no. <laughs> and that was the end of the news story that yes. I never heard from them again. Yes. Okay, we, we have some additional, it was gene therapy, it wasn't cloning with uh, Jesse Which Gelsinger. Was. Oh, okay. Um, it was at Penn. He had a yeah. life-threatening entity. I don't know what, I don't know what, entity, what, what he means there. Um, but anyway, okay, we're, we're gonna do one more question. And sure. To, to, sorry, there was one further up that I skipped over and now I'm trying to go back to it. This, this is another real gen, general one, but still a very good one. Should we have more STEM training in junior high and high school, increase art and music or decrease something else to include these subjects? And I was a former high school teacher and, and for a while an adjunct at a community college and there's so much pressure to add well, you know, because you have kids to add stuff and but you're supposed to keep teaching the stuff you were teaching and you you know that the pressure on teachers is enormous. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, more more STEM is always a good thing, but you know, time is finite. And so if you say let's have more STEM, that means let's have less X. Yeah. Whatever it's going to be. Um, I think some of it also is in the way that we present STEM, which is which is again different in different places. But the more we can get scientists into schools um, and and not just have the kids sitting and doing the worksheets, which was my experience in some science classes in high school, where it was, okay, what are we going to learn today in astronomy? Oh, the moon worksheet again. I finished the moon worksheet. <laughs> so it's a study hall. Yeah. All right. Um, the, the more we can, you know, the, the more we can actually get real scientists to explain what it is they really do. Because even when I became a scientist, when I went to the lab for the first time, I didn't understand what really happens. I didn't understand what it was like to work in a, in a lab. Um, I, the first lab I worked in was, it was a, as a summer student in college. It was uh, at DuPont, um, actually close to where you guys are, the experimental station in Wilmington, which is no longer there. Um, and basically, I was in a, a lab working on uh, studying HIV. And there were some proteins that bound to each other, and we were going to try to create a way to screen for compounds that may disrupt that. And one of the first things my um, my boss showed me was, look, here's this here's this gel that shows the proteins bind to each other. Look at this line, this line. It means that these proteins bind. And I was thinking, like, but we know those proteins bind to each other. Why did you go to the trouble to put them on a gel and show that? Like, what are you wasting time for? I didn't understand that. Like, if you want to study these proteins, you first have to make them. And making them is not easy and can take years to figure out how to even do it correctly. Mm. So he was excited that he had made his starting materials to then study. Um, I think I, I kind of pictured science as you go in, we're trying to find an HIV drug. Let's try orange juice. Oh my God, it works. You know, <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of, uh, I've never come home from the, and, and said, I've had a breakthrough in the lab today, the way they do on, you know, on movies TV. and on TV. Yeah. So. Yeah. there's um, is, is a bit of a disconnect into what the world of science is really like. Yeah, yes, it's much harder than it looks. And I'm going to do one more because... Um, sure, and, and more I incremental know. than it looks too. Yes, yes. Yeah. One of my friends went for a, a degree in mechanical engineering and, and she finished, it, but she said she was surprised at how tedious so much of the work was. Yeah. She thought it was going to be a lot more exciting. And she finished and she was happy. Um, uh, from Tamara, how much responsibility do news media networks have in spreading science misinformation? Huh. <laughs> do you have yeah. enough 10 hours? Yeah, um, I mean, and most, most science journalists are not scientists, am I right? Um, most science journalists are not scientists, but that's not to say that they're that they're bad at it. I mean, mm -hmm. a, a lot of scientists, science journalists are scientifically literate enough to to know what it is they're writing about. Again, it's it's such a spectrum because journalists are human beings. <clears throat> and, and once something is out there, it gets, it gets interpreted however the reader wants to interpret it too. You could have a, a scientist journalist write about something absolutely perfectly, and then a second news source that puts things out based on other news sources mm -hmm. takes it and gets one thing wrong, and that gets captured as the headline in a third news source yeah. um, to the point where it's not even news that's the issue because we're all sharing everything these days and mm -hmm. everyone's just it's like that that um foods uh, dna and foods survey <laughs> i was guilty of that too i looked at that and i thought oh my god i can't believe scientific literacy is so low that 80 percent of americans want no it's not that 80 percent of americans want mandatory labels on foods containing dna it's that a survey of a hundred and something people was done one time in 2015 in oklahoma where they asked this question in this way and got this response. And so it was a perfect example of like the knee jerk reaction we all have of reading something and taking from it what we want to take from it and then broadcasting that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I mean, so we, we have to be careful of that. And yes, the, the news media has a responsibility to, um, to not portray things in a, in a biased manner, but um, Sometimes it's not them. Sometimes it's those who read and share and amplify them too. Excellent. And the very last comment in here, I think that this person speaks for everybody. Thank you. It was an amazing lecture, Adam. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So for everybody else, and Adam, you're certainly willing to uh, 
uh, welcome to join us on Zoom next month. It'll be Susan Gerbic, who is the Wikipediatrician, I think she's called. The meetup um, thing is already out there. Now I'm getting a lot of thank yous, thank yous, thank yous. And that's, they're thanking you, Adam. They're not thanking right. me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Susan will be talking about how she spent the lockdown. She's a very good speaker. That's all I have. Adam, thank you so much. And good luck tonight. My heavens, you have two presentations to do today? Um, three. It's actually back-to-back -back shows in Baltimore because the, the theater didn't hold as many people as we You're thought, doing two tonight? I'm going to, doing two, six o'clock and, or no, 6.30 and nine o'clock. Um, oh, my heavens. But... We'll let you go so you can rest a bit. <laughs> Thanks. All thank right. You so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks so much, Adam. Thank you. It was great. Thank you.